I'm Don Botson. I'm the president of BARD, and um, the most important thing I have to say is to welcome all of you. The conference began yesterday, as I understand it, and um, I, um, I always like, if, if I can, to uh, welcome um, all of you to this conference and to um, belabor the obvious, which is to say that um, the Hannah Arendt Center has been a, um, a terrific and um, outstanding um, aspect of what Bard does, and I want to pay tribute to Roger and all his colleagues. And um, <clears throat> I want to say that uh, I've said this before as sort of the um, one of the still living uh, survivors of uh, having been a student of Hannah Arendt's that uh, when she died, um, I don't think many of us expected that she would assume the prominence that she has, not only in the United States, but um, throughout the world as um, a kind of um, touchstone of the way we talk about politics, particularly. Um, it is um, one of the erasures of history to assume after a person's death that um, they were always viewed with such prominence or such respect or such interest. And it wasn't the case uh, in her lifetime. And uh, it is, um, it's extraordinary actually to look back and to see how influential and how important her works have been. Um, on this subject, which is, um, as I understand it, in the title has the words rage, reason, and tyranny, in no particular order, um, but um, those, um, those three words are words which um, <clears throat> do have a, a place in her work um, and um, are obviously uh, concerns that we have um, in our own time. I want to apologize, I just got off a plane. I have to go off three things, very, none of them entirely well connected, uh, but just food for thought. I just landed <clears throat> from um, uh, Jerusalem and uh, where um, we had, um, after the pandemic hiatus of um, three years, a little more than two years, um, a graduation of our joint program with Al-Quds University on the West Bank. And um, that program um, has a, an honors college, a liberal arts college, and a master's degree program where we train teachers for the Palestinian Authority. And we've trained well over a thousand teachers of middle and high school students uh, throughout uh, Palestine. and. Um, have a very lively and um, remarkable student body, and we gave out uh, degrees and um, both masters and um, BA degrees. And um, the event took place, it was scheduled uh, long in advance, but took place a day late because there was a shooting uh, of an Israeli soldier uh, at the checkpoint before one of the remaining uh, Palestinian refugee camps, which are, is in the municipality of Jerusalem. It's a walled off area, uh, extremely poor, and um, a kind of desperate, intense uh, area in which uh, well over 100,000 people live. And um, as a result, um, the West Bank called a general strike um, for Wednesday, which was the day in which our meetings with our Al Quds. Uh, <clears throat> partners, the university, um, and we had a meeting with the ministry, the education ministry of Palestine, and um, that was all shifted to, um, to yesterday. Um, I was struck in the um, graduation ceremony, which has Palestinian families and, their, and the graduates and faculty and um, residents of the West Bank, that um, there were many speeches, and we met earlier in the day with the um, Palestinian Minister of Education. Um, and um, these speeches were unusual because you could tell that the student speakers 
um, spoke not only to the existing crowd, but you could tell one of them in particular spoke with the, I think, understanding that what she said was less important in the event that was taking place with the people there than its extract or its whole or part um, distribution through social media. That it wasn't really um, about um, what we were witnessing um, was not the whole impact of that speech, but for the first time, anything anybody says um, is recorded and can be distributed. And if one speaks with that in mind, um, apart from the fact that there's a kind of reduction of any kind of real private speech, um, and um, there are practically fewer opportunities to think aloud, to think aloud, so that what one says is assumed to be declarative, not speculative. That there's no way to do something which actually Hannah Arendt was expert at, which is to think on her feet. And so that what she said wasn't necessarily what she in the ended up thinking was right, but she was very interested in the response that she got in real time from the people whom she was speaking to. That we have a belief that what comes out of one's mouth is the result of kind of closed deliberation, the way a politician might edit everything that that person says with the understanding that it's dispositive about their beliefs. And that's not the case, and that should not be the case in university that we should be permitted to be able to speculate, to think aloud, and um, think aloud with participants, and then see what that response is and hear what that response is. In this case, in the ceremony, every speaker was conscious of something that is different from our own circumstances. Uh, these are young people living with obvious reasons for rage and under a tyranny, a tyranny of an occupation and a severe and not always predictable uh, restriction on their freedom of movement and their freedom of speech. And their theme was um, the importance of the freedom to speak, the freedom to reason, the freedom to find a political process with which they could participate that is not only one of violence, but of thought and persuasion, and how difficult that has become. And that has become more difficult with the presence of social media. What is missing? when we see our politics driven by social media exchange are things that are not always obvious. So I'm gonna say things that are absolutely walking through open doors. So I apologize for the simplicity of what I have to say. One of the things that's missing is not only the give and take, not only the speculative nature of public speaking and the speculative nature of putting forth ideas, interpretations, and claims, and then being able to retract them, to amend them, to change them. But you don't have the sound of the voice in real time. We know this in the world of music, and also this was the case when television first appeared in the political arena that what people look like, look, I'll come to that in a moment, but certainly what they sound like is very different in the acoustic space that we live with and the recorded space, even if it's a video. That the meaning of what one says has a kind of musical, sonic aspect to it, the way one speaks and the way one is heard. 
and the emotional overtone that is not strictly linguistic. And that's lost in the, the distribution, let's say, of one of these speeches that was at the graduation. The second is the visual element, that um, there is a dynamic in the response of the crowd. So it is, it is in a way, um, stripping our ability to reason with language from the human, sensual, real presence of being with other people. So, um, having gone through this long day and getting on a plane, um, I, um, I looked at the video options, movies, things like that, and I stumbled on what must be a 1950s production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar with Marlon Brando, John Gilgood, and James Mason. In the scene, the way this movie was made, of the two orations that come after the murder of Julius Caesar, the one by Brutus, and the one by Mark Anthony, the more famous one. When the filmmakers made the recording for the viewer of the response of the crowd, the citizens of Rome, to the murder of Caesar, one could see the reaction of the speaker rhetorically to the reaction of the crowd and members of the crowd seeing and hearing the interjections of people in the same space. What was remarkable is that the film managed to capture the rapidity with which groups change their views, the facility of the ability to manipulate a crowd, not only to give it rise to anger, but also to turn it from one position to another. And the brilliance of the Shakespearean juxtaposition of these two rhetorical strategies, that of Brutus and that of Mark Antony, that these rhetorical strategies had their power in their impact in real time and real place with the crowd to whom they were speaking. And that he was able to replicate the shift in tone and manner. In the negotiation of politics, it is that fluidity of response which allows people to think, react, change and alter um, that um, was captured in the, in the film. In the media that we deal with, whether it's a video or a photograph or a quote, in the distribution in social media, the anonymity and impersonality of the claims and their fragmentation, therefore taking them out of the context of the moment or the political context, it can be devastating. So she obviously wrote before these opportunities existed beyond television, I would say, and her idealized public space always took into, took into account this human interaction of sound, the visual, and the ability to negotiate in real time a transformation and adaptation, the reaching of consensus or the breaking up of consensus. The, um, the third point I want to make is that um, all of this, the presence of social media, has, whether we like it or not, undercut any confidence by the individual that they can ascertain what might be true, what might not be true, 
and that there is no amount of compensation for the argument that would undercut or diminish an impression that is false. The ability for lies, distortions, and for the defamation of individuals to run like wildfire through a crowd that never sees one another, that never interacts. So I might think that person is not only wrong, but criminal. That person is truly a bad person. That's a bad actor. That's a dangerous view. And that I'm not in the position of seeing what other people might think in real time and real place, which would allow me to even reconsider my initial reaction. I might be disturbed by something someone says, and then as being part of that real time, real place community, I might actually find myself changing my views. And we're in the business of trying to find out how we can change people's views or get some agreement of where ambiguity lies, some ability to compromise, some ability to contextualize, some ability to forgive, some ability to, um, to provide an empathetic understanding for that which we don't agree with. The, um, the terrifying aspect of a real mob in a real place cannot be underestimated. But the impersonal, fragmented, isolated mob that doesn't interact and with which we cannot interact as a participant is, um, has its own actually terrifying aspect. And one of its terrifying aspects is actually to deepen rage, to connect the personal and the political in an isolated circumstance, and without any recourse in the act of speaking, so in which speaking is action, to come to terms with that rage and find a way to channel it, to diminish it, to make it constructive. So in fact, we have an ideal public space through social media for the fragmentation, which is the precondition of tyranny, especially given our predilection to believe the worst of our fellow human being. The idea that in the aftermath of genocide, especially in the Second World War, to still believe in a residual shared humanity um, is one of the redeeming features of Hannah Arendt's work. And to believe in that shared humanity, despite all the evidence, to return to the possibility that uh, we can find ways to live together with all differences and work together and reason and which language isn't distorted by its extraction from the moment and from the community to which that speech has been addressed. That fragmentation um, deepens the inability to, um, to find common ground. So um, uh, it's a dangerous moment and a dangerous moment in which the, um, the ability to come to some agreement about what is true, what is the circumstances, and to think aloud, speculatively, in the effort to come to an agreement or compromise um, about circumstances which, um, about which there can be legitimate disagreements and about things that deeply affect our future issues of inequality, of justice. Um, the social media as it is now lived with by individuals, especially in the post-pandemic environment, that that uh, ability 
is deeply uh, eroded, which is, I suspect, what this conference is trying to deal with. Um, what was very encouraging is the, despite all the reasons for rage and for, um, for a sense of the oppressive might of occupation and tyranny, how optimistic, how generous, and how idealistic our Palestinian colleagues and students showed themselves to be. So I returned, landed in my naturalized home with a renewed sense of the possibility. But that possibility wasn't underscored by any participation in social media, which I'm pleased never to have been part of. So I wish you very well, and um, thank you, Roger. Thank you all for participating, and have a very good day. I especially want to welcome the students from the Bard High Schools. Thank you. <laughs>